give you a few nuggets every single week as we go through the book of Acts because it is indeed uh, a, a letter that was written, uh, some believe, no later than the year 70, 70 AD. So that's almost uh, 2,000 years ago. Uh, but it was certainly a book that was written uh, by what many people uh, uh, consider uh, the same author of the Gospel according to Luke. Uh, and uh, Luke is considered to have been uh, the uh, writer of this book uh, that we call the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, some people even uh, call Acts Luke Part 2. Alright? I mean, literally because... Uh, Luke is attempting to not only tell of the story of Jesus, but also Luke is attempting to tell how those who were impacted by the story of Jesus actually put the story into practice. How many of you know it's not just enough to be impacted by the story of Jesus, but you got to put the story into practice? So Luke was written uh, in the year 70. And what was also very interesting about uh, this uh, pat or these, these letters or these chapters that we are going to spend the month preaching through uh, is you find that Luke is certainly writing to a Greek audience, right? But he is also writing uh, what we see here as an apology, not a, like a I'm sorry an apology, but a defense of the gospel. That many people even think, after you really do some literary kind of uh, 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 reflection on this passage, that Luke was attempting to make sure that everyone who read this letter, particularly back in the first several hundred years of the church, were able to actually appreciate the, the, the legal kind of protections that the Christian faith should be given underneath Roman law. For uh, Roman law, particularly Roman religion, uh, was not monotheistic, it was polytheistic, meaning that to be a pagan back then meant that you only worshiped one God. Back in the Roman times, if you were a pagan, they, that meant that you only worshiped one God. Because they believed that in order uh, to uh, make every God happy, you needed to worship all of them. And they felt like if you worship one God, then the God that you didn't worship would get upset, and that God would overthrow your empire. So think about this. As Rome, uh, the Roman Empire spread and they conquered other people and they conquered other nations, they did not ask them to uh, convert to their religion per se, they would just line up their God next to all the panoply of God that they would worship. But what was interesting, Rome did require everybody to convert uh, their money, <laughs> their kind of cultural beliefs, and all these other kinds of pieces, but the religion, they just left space for the worship of many gods. So here comes this Christian religion, here comes the, 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 the claims of Jesus all of a sudden rubbing up very powerfully or very agitationally against the claims of the Roman government. And, and according to the Gospel of Luke and according to the record we have in Acts, every mention of the Gospel that is on trial by Luke, it renders a not guilty verdict. That the Roman uh, court system, whenever they brought the apostles in front of the Roman courts, they were always vindicated and they were always considered not guilty. Why is this important? Well, it's important because many believe that the book of Luke uh, Acts was actually used by Christian lawyers later on in the history of the church to show that the Christian faith deserve legal protection under the Roman law. Amen. So you find all of these wonderful kind of appropriations and uses of the early uh, uh, scriptures that we're going to read. And, and uh, this is one such record that uh, I believe is, is, is very powerful in the uh, book of Acts chapter number 3, right on the heels of uh, this Pentecost experience that we preached about uh, last week, right on the heels of this revolution that we talked about uh, being televised and proclaimed uh, to everyone around us, we find Peter and John uh, attempting to go on with their daily lives, but in the course of their life, they have another opportunity to televise this revolution. Let's go to Acts chapter number 3, verse number 1. The word of the Lord simply says this, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And a man lame 
from birth was being carried in. People would lay uh, him daily at the gate of the temple called Beautiful so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. And when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising. And they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. The word of God for the people of God. Let us all say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So we're going to spend, like I said, this whole month uh, preaching and teaching a little bit on uh, how to build Christian community. Today's sermon simply will be, uh, it's already inside of you. It's already inside of you. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God. This prayer for us, the people of God, we ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Have yourself on the chest and say, it's already inside of me. Inside. Now, one of the great lies that is told to us often is that we don't have what it takes. People are always... Uh, willing to, uh, without your inquiry, remind you of how you don't have what it takes. You're constantly besieged by all kinds of messages that speak to the lack rather than to the excess, the surplus of all that is within our grasp and our reach. I remember reading and teaching a book here with some of our leaders out of the Leadership Essentials book, and it listed reasons why people do not step into their greatness, step into their role as influencers, as uh, people who are able to lead and make impact. Uh, five reasons uh, that the book listed was people feel like they have an equipment shortage, meaning that they have not been equipped or they don't have the tools. Some others say that they have a description deficit, meaning that they don't have a clear job description or a vision that makes clear how they are able to be engaged or engage. Some people say they have image issues, meaning that they don't see themselves as the leader or influencer type. That they are more a fix uh, 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 rather than give who consumes rather than produces, that in their mind, the way that uh, leadership and impact and influence is, is, is articulated, they feel like I don't fit that mold. Another excuse that is often given is people feel like there's a coaching crisis, saying if I only had a mentor or someone to apprentice me, so I was able step by step uh, to be guided into the world of influencing and leading. Others also say that there's a passion problem, a <laughs> gap in their ability to locate or identify the compelling need. The people are uh, often uh, short-circuited from moving with engagement of intentionality because they don't feel like they have what it takes. But I love uh, the Word of God, particularly 2 Peter 1, verse 3. Uh, it's one of my favorite passages in Scripture. Uh, write it down, read it later, uh, but listen, listen to what the Word of God says. I'm the message version. It says, everything you need for life and godliness, everything that goes into a life of pleasing God has been miraculously given to us by getting to know personally and intimately the one who invited us to God. 
the one is Jesus and not me. Somebody say amen. amen. That the best invitation we ever received was given to us and we are also given absolutely terrific promises that we can pass on that are tickets to participating in the life of God after you have been turned back from your corrupted way of living looks like this. Do not lose a minute in building on what you've been given but complement your basic faith with good care. Mm -hmm. Spiritual understanding, alert discipline, passionate patience, reverent wonder, warm friendliness, and generous love, each dimension fitting into and developing the others. You see, child of God, what I want you to realize is that with all of the spirit at your disposal, all of the gifts of God that are laid in front of you, you and I have within us the power and the ability to accomplish whatever assignment that has been uniquely given to us as a task. Unless you think that this task is radically located in the church and in ministry, quote unquote, I want to remind you that ministry is not just about your position at church. Amen. Because how many of you know, if that's all it's about, then every other moment that you're not in church, you can live your life however you want to live your life. Say it, preacher. But when we understand that building up the kingdom of God, creating Christian community is not just about how you live or act or serve at the way, but it's about how you live and act and serve everywhere your foot steps, everything your hand touches, every word comes out of your mouth. It is a part of the building up of the kingdom of God. And God is saying it like this, that whatever I placed inside of you has the ability to impact whatever environment I have you in. That's right. That's right. Dr. King famously talks about thermostats and thermometers. And how many of us think that we are thermometers, that we are only to reflect the uh, external environments as it pertains to what's going on rather than the thermostat which actually sets the environment's temperature. Ooh, what would it look like, child of God, if tomorrow you woke up and believed you were a thermostat? Not a thermometer. That You're not going into a situation reacting to what the situation always produces. But you are going into the situation understanding that with the power of God that is placed inside of you, you have what it takes to set the atmosphere. And you and I must be people who are committed to setting the atmosphere for the building up of the kingdom of God. My question then to all of us is why do we limit the scope of our impact and our reach to esoteric and amorphous rituals reserved for certain times and days of the week? ability to impact your life day to day? Does not the revolution that we are called to be televising, broadcasting, proclaiming, uh, bringing about, doesn't it necessitate more than a one day a week display? Don't you and I live our lives 24 hours a day, seven days a week as a follower of Jesus? Somebody say amen. amen. Because quite frankly, one of the greatest challenges with the revolution, the Jesus revolution, is that all the revolutionaries are only living the Jesus revolution, uh, you know, once or twice a week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody say amen. 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 The Jesus revolution is only happening when you're around other Jesus revolutionaries. Yeah. 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 Amen. So, so when you're in your Bible 
operated all throughout history.
That's why I'm late all the time. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But but how many of you know sometimes that we can be so hung up on getting to the place of uh, spiritual and faith practice that we forget to practice our faith? Right, right, right. Yes. Right. I'm running to the house of God. I came running when they said unto me, <laughs> let us go into the house of the Lord. You running by every need. Yeah. Yeah. Every yeah. kind of opportunity to serve. I mean, you just run. <laughs> run into the house of God. <laughs> Peter and John understood that these faith practices, these prayers, and these uh, times of gathering put them in a position to address the problems as they confronted them. And I want you to know, child of God, that engaging in these practices, some of us aren't able to respond faithfully because we're not in prayer enough. We're not fasting enough. We're not in worship enough. We're not in study enough. So no wonder whenever hardship comes, you respond the way you used to respond before you were following Jesus. Right. Or some of you are like, no, Pastor, I've been responding like this ever since I started following Jesus. It's like, well, that's another reason why you probably need to pray some more. How many of you know, if you cussing people out and fussing and fighting and threatening and, re and, and repaying evil for evil, rather than, you know, repaying evil with good, then you are not praying and engaging up in the practices so they change us. If you can't forgive folk, you got to work, you got some ways to go in engaging in the practices. If you can't serve anybody, if you have to always be your way or the highway, if, it, if, if you're always worried about what, what's going to happen to you on the other side, deeper into engaging in the practices. Second thing the text brings up, I love this part. Verse number four, a Peter looked intently at them as did John and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. The second thing that is required for us that will impact the world with that which is inside of us is we all must learn to recognize
that even if I made a mistake, that mistake is my name, is not my name. Right. That condition is not my name. I am a child of God. And this is the redemptive power of the gospel. But if the church can't live that out, and we can feel comfortable sitting next to folk who, who may not have been where we've been, or may not be going where we're going, or may not have had the same struggle we've had, and we start feeling uncomfortable because Against my uh, St. John, just a little, little too, 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 too. <laughs> Then I've had other folks say, you know, uh, that's right, uh, you know, one another. And then the third thing that the scripture says is that you and I must get our hands dirty. Somebody say, get your hands dirty. <laughs> Jesus gave us the paradigm. Scripture says that when he was in heaven, he did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped or held on to, but he humbled himself and became even in the form of a servant, took on human flesh. It's called Get the 
first time. Yeah. Yeah. I know that you know the Bible backward and forward. I know you know every hymn. I know you know every scripture. I know you know how to holler. I know you know how to dance. I know you know how to do all that stuff. But tell you that you still didn't get it the first time. You gotta be willing to walk with folks no matter how long it takes them to get it. That's called getting your hands dirty. And my problem with some of us today is that we just expect folks to get stuff faster than what we got. Some of us have been in church our whole lives, some of them have followed Jesus for 20 years, and you still can't forgive nobody. Come on, Hello, somebody. You still can't let it go. You still mad about what happened to you at your last church. Yeah, come on, preacher. Coming up in here telling me, I don't, I don't care about that. Let it go. You would never hop out and tell them, let it go. So you still hung up on what your mom and them did to you, what your daddy and them did to you, what your uncle and your auntie and your brother and your sister. But child of God, you have to learn to let it go so you can begin to help somebody else. Right, that's right. Preach, preacher. I believe that in order to get our hands dirty, Embrace the nexus of responsibility. The nexus of responsibility means that there are many multiple ways for us to plug in. Abraham Joshua Heschel, he's a rabbi, and this is what he says. He says, few are guilty, but all of us are responsible. Oh, God Almighty. Few are guilty. Only few of us can really stand up and, and, and get the guilt burning jumped on top of us, but how many all of us are responsible? In the nexus of responsibility, I call it personal responsibility. But that's the last thing. 